Okay, welcome everyone uh, to the session entitled Vulnerability of Key Resources. I'm John Woodruff, uh, co-university director of the Northeast Climate Adaptation Science Center. Um, our moderator today is Francis Griswold, who is a NECASC graduate fellow, uh, and I'm going to hand it off to her to introduce the speakers. Thanks, Francis. Thanks, John. Uh, so today, our first speaker is going to be Amanda Babson from the National Park Service, and she will be talking about developing a climate change vulnerability assessment strategy for the National Park Service. Okay, hi everyone. Thanks so much for having me. Can you see that in presentation mode? Great, thank you. So um, excited to be able to share with you all today the work of my Park Service colleagues on developing a climate change vulnerability assessment strategy. Um, the Park Service is well positioned to be strategic about expanding our vulnerability assessments and their use. We're developing a vulnerability assessment strategy, but it isn't ready yet for sharing. Today, I'll share with you um, what we've learned that may help other agencies that are also in the process of developing your own strategies. Uh, vulnerability assessments are an important step in the climate change planning process. Uh, this figure here um, is from our uh, guidance document that came out earlier this year on planning for a change in climate, which is based on a combination of the um, Climate Smart Conservation and some of our scenario planning work and is intended for um, Park Service wide, not just for natural resources. And the Park Service has been developing a variety of vulnerability assessment methods based on um, a wide variety of things. So what parks maybe um, have developed about focusing on particular resources or as opportunities arise where a partner may be doing an assessment that a, a park may fall within that and, and we can take advantage of that opportunity. Uh, I think of it as a let a thousand flowers bloom. Uh, and we recognize the need to be a little bit more strategic and learn from what we've done so far. We actually in the Northeast started um, a little bit further back with our coastal work. Um, we had partners at the University of Rhode Island uh, uh, look across the coastal vulnerability assessments and they developed a guidance doc on designing and scoping coastal vulnerability assessments that was published in 2017. And that motivated the um, integrated vulnerability assessment me method, um, which I'll, I'll um, explain a little bit about later. Uh, but today I'll be sharing where we're at, uh, at a national level with the Park Service, where we have evaluated the vulnerability assessments in order to develop some best practices and develop this strategy towards trying to um, cover the vulnerability assessments for as many parks as possible and, and as many resources as possible. So two efforts I'll share with you today are what we refer to as the assessment of vulnerability assessments and NPVOM with the idea that we want to prioritize our needs for vulnerability assessments and best allocate resources. So the purpose of a vulnerability assessment is you want to identify for us what park resources and values are at risk, why and where, and how those risks change over time. There's not a one size fits all, it really varies. And as we go forward, we're not gonna settle on one best thing. It's going to be a variety of approaches. Uh, in order to design them so they can match the, the planning and decision-making needs uh, of parks. Uh, and it's not a one and done activity. We may do one that's at a, at a high level, and then that may inform us that for a particular resource, we need further um, vulnerability information or more quantitative vulnerability assessment for a particular decision. Uh, so there's a real range between qualitative to quantitative efforts. and. Uh, there's pluses and minuses for all of them, and we have um, learned for, you know, our, we're improving our methods for, for all of them to best make them useful to parks. Uh, we're settling on some common language, uh, and so how the, the definitions of vulnerability uh, that we're using are shown here, and the basic framework um, in this figure, which comes from the Scanning the Conservation Horizon Guidance document, uh, but also has been uh, this combination of vulnerability as a combination of exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity also has been included in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. 
Uh, the one thing that we have been uh, working on is this definition of adaptive capacity, which is inclusive of both that intrinsic ability, um, such as a salt marsh to, to migrate landward, but also some of those management um, adaptive capacity. And the guidance that's been developed by our facilities and cultural resource vulnerability assessment efforts um, is that we shouldn't include adaptive capacity. So those non-living cultural resources and those facilities that don't have the intrinsic uh, adaptive capacity, we want to still assess adaptive capacity uh, in those, those more uh, organizational, social, and economic senses, but communicate that separately, not say, oh, well, we have, we're, something is less vulnerable because we may, you know, potentially have the, the organizational or economic potential to, to adapt. Uh, one of the protocols that has developed that, that guidance for facilities is one on coastal facilities vulnerability assessments. Our partners at Western Carolina University developed this for us, where we were looking in facilities for a consistent protocol that could be used um, comparable across parks uh, and that they have done already for 20 parks. They're trying to complete the Southeast region uh, currently and the remaining Northeast parks that haven't already been done will be, will be moving forward uh, this fiscal year. And the protocol assesses scores and maps for all of the um, buildings and roads that are in our facilities management software system and it does both exposure and sensitivity for them through a combination of these national, nationally available data sets uh, and also uh, qualitative information based on um, expert judgment on the sensitivity, some of the sensitivity indicators. Uh, for cultural and natural resources, we have a range of efforts that's been done out there, um, a lot more for, for natural resources than for cultural resources, but have been done focused on some cultural resource types, such as cultural landscapes, current work is ongoing on archaeological sites, or for programs such as in the, the desert southwest, we have the Vanishing Treasures program, so at a, a regional scale trying to um, focus on cultural resource vulnerability assessments. Uh, but we also recognize the need to park wide, look across different resource types and have an integrated vulnerability assessment. And so partners at the University of Rhode Island developed that method for us. And um, the real value in that was being able to have those con conversations about a location that has different types of resources and the decisions we may make to, to protect a historic structure has implications for our options um, for some of our natural resources, for instance. So. Uh, that has been a valuable process. Um, stepping back to, I mentioned the assessment of vulnerability assessments. The idea was to take that at, at uh, national scale and provide an inventory of what had been published um, and also evaluate across those to try and work towards some best practices and recommendations so that we could be more strategic going forward. And the way we did that is we had partners at three different universities take different chapters uh, for natural resources, for cultural resources and infrastructure, and assess each of those, what had been done. And this map here shows um, the, the green trees are all the natural resource ones. You can see there, there are a lot more natural resource vulnerability assessments. The yellow circles are cultural resource ones, and uh, there are fewer of those. And the brown squares are for infrastructure. And you can see, uh, as I mentioned, those are mostly those coastal ones. Uh, and these were ones that were completed, published through 2018, where our partners had developed this. Uh, th this report is still not uh, uh, published. Apologies to our partners who did their work, but we're in the stage of, for that synthesis, we re recognized that, that we needed to, to, it couldn't just be partners, it needed the, the Park Service capacity to, to make some of these decisions about what our recommendations are going forward for best practices. And that's where we're moving forward now towards this strategy. Uh, some of in evaluating those uh, assessments, some of the methodological challenges were things like inconsistent use of terms or protocols, uh, and um, that that can be confusing. People have different ideas of what it means to, to have a vulnerability assessment or even what vulnerability is. Um, some of the organizational challenges where we really need you know park staff to fully engage either in the design so that it's useful or the execution, uh, and that's not always possible. Um, some of these had been done and, and parks weren't aware of it, so making sure that, that we're communicating and have them uh, accessible. Uh, and then uh, the, this challenge for, for this particular effort is that, you know, we can get collaborators to do some, some evaluations for us, but we do need that internal capacity to come up with our best practices as the Park Service. 
Uh, some of the recommendations that came out of the effort are that we want to make sure that the vulnerability assessments are designed to match park needs and that they're reported so, it, so the communication will be used for, for management decisions. Uh, to evaluate all components of vulnerability, so not just exposure, a lot of what's been done has only focused on exposure. Uh, to standardize the terminology, to address uncertainty, uh, to embrace partnerships. So this is so important that we engage um, other expertise, including the, the CASCs, uh, and identify where we can focus on, because um, we can't cover everything, what are the vulnerabilities that most threaten our management goals. And towards that, I want to share with you about this other effort, NPVOM. This was done by partners at the University of Washington, the same one who did the natural resource chapter for the assessment of vulnerability assessments. And the idea was to, to develop some high level screening where we could identify geographies and issues that were highest priorities for future vulnerability assessments. And one of the ways they did that was coming up with indicators that were, the goal was nationally available, but a lot of it was continental uh, US. Um, to identify parks that are priority for more detailed vulnerability assessment. Um, and they part of that were these indicators, the figure on the right shows that we had um, the, those exposure indicators uh, in red, we had 27, which is a lot more than what's available for sensitivity and a lot more than that than what's available for adaptive capacity. Um, for of the indicators, there were some that were identified as this high impact. And so high impact is because there's the potential driver of system transformation. So sea level rise, fire, drought, and forest insect pest and disease um, were all included. Freshwater floods we recognize is one, but we don't have those indicators currently available. Uh, and then they found that most parks are highly vulnerable, vulnerable to climate change. 57% of parks to these high impact factors, if you include all the other um, indicators, 71% of parks. Um, and the, so from that, we know that there's a variety of approaches we can go forward to strategically fill those needs. So sometimes it's going to be based on geography, some on those we could do an assessment, grouping on the high impact threats or on a particular resources. The idea is we could group, group parks, um, such as the, this figure here, you can say, see where the high impact threats are, um, they can be grouped together and the recommendation to, to conduct with partners so that we're leveraging that, that expertise. So particular to the Northeast, they found that of all the ecoregions they looked at is that we had the highest proportion uh, with high of parks with high potential um, vulnerability scores. This was due to a couple of factors. One is because we have big changes in, projected in our climate conditions as well as high human footprints. Um, the high impact factors that we're exposed to are sea level rise and forest pest and disease. And the opportunity in terms of clustering um, by park type. We have a lot of um, parks such as battlefields that we could cluster together or urban parks. Uh, and so some of the challenges that, that were identified in, in NPVOM was if when they overlay that with the assessment of vulnerability assessments where the park assessments had already been done, 70% of those priority parks that uh, in NPVOM don't already have, as of 2018, a, a published vulnerability assessment. And then some of those that do, um, it might have just been for one resource, but it needs to be more co comprehensive. And identifying that infrastructure had pretty much only been done for coastal, uh, that there's inadequate condition assessment for cultural resources and infrastructure, and this freshwater flooding need. Regionally, Alaska and islands, we don't have the data sets. Uh, in terms of moving forward on developing this vulnerability assessment strategy, um, we're well positioned. We have created a cross-directed coordination uh, to, between our uh, divisions of, of natural, cultural, and facilities. Uh, and we are supporting parks that already have vulnerability assessment to make sure they get used in adaptation planning and implementation. Um, we've learned from what's already been completed, as well as trying to learn from the ongoing challenges of some of them that aren't yet done. We've identified some of the gaps and needs. Uh, we're trying to do better about making the, the products um, discoverable and communicating the results, because the most important thing is to make sure they get used in decision making. Uh, we, I've meant, referred to a number of uh, reports, so we have published reports on a bunch of these that are available. And I would like to thank, um, in particular, within the NPS Climate Change Response Program, we have a vulnerability assessment flagship team. So 
those folks have contributed to developing this, as well as our partners at Western Carolina University, University of Washington, Boise State, University of Rhode Island, and the many other that have done those, those variety of, of uh, vulnerability assessments that we've been able to learn from. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Amanda. That was a great talk. Um, if anyone has any questions, please, please feel free to put them in the Q&A portion. Um, and if there's any questions from anyone else on the call, this would be a great time to put them in and ask them. Uh, yes, John. Hey, Amanda, that was fantastic. Thanks for the, <laughs> the journey through the activities there. Um, uh, uh, really interesting. So one thing that I am, I've, I've, we've been grappling with a lot in the adaptation plans that I've been involved in is something that you mentioned um, and that is common to all adaptation plans is that um, it takes in sometimes years to get these things out. And by time, by the time they're out, the science has changed a bit. And so I, I this is common to all adaptation plans, uh, but I'm just wondering if you've had any thought, if you could provide any thoughts on, on how to address that. Yeah, that's a great point, right? We theoretically, we say this is an iterative process, but we don't have the, okay, let's, you know, we don't have the process to say, okay, you know, it's been this much longer, let's go back and, and revisit what things have changed. Uh, in particular, right, for our coastal parks, we have our, you know, we for those facilities vulnerability assessments, we had consistent sea level rise projections for all parks, but the, the science of that is rapidly changing. And so we need to be able to adjust for future parks and how do you, you know, if you do the new ones with different scenarios, have that, you know, comparison so you can prioritize uh, bet between parks. So. It's a challenge, and I think that so far we've been um, trying to, to use our, I think that the best way forward is uh, some of our uh, vulnerability work we often do in conjunction with scenario planning. And scenario planning gives you a lot of that flexibility to say, okay, we don't know exactly how things are going to be, but we recognize we need to have multiple options. Uh, and so I think that's one avenue forward, uh, but I think we do need to, to be able to have, you know, des design our protocols so that th there's ways to go back without a major uh, uh, time commitment to, to update things. Awesome, thank you. We have a few questions that came, oh, sorry, Don. Um, we have a few questions that came into the chat, so I'll read those. So first we have one from Scott Schwenk. Um, wonderful presentation. Could you give any examples of how results have been used by parks and any lessons in what has made them useful from that standpoint? Uh, so I, the example I uh, know best, I think that I've, I've been sharing is with Colonial National Historical Park. Uh, so they've followed from an integrated vulnerability assessment they've gone for, recognized one thing is that the archeological sites on Jamestown Island were in that assessment, pretty much all high vulnerable and how do you, you know, then prioritize among those. And so they've been pursuing that um, and, and being able to, the, for the work on um, archeological site vulnerability assessments, developing things, you know, how do we have things more specific to archeological sites so we can differentiate. Um, within uh, vulnerability assessments. And then also for facilities, they went through one of these processes. So for the, for where we finished the facilities vulnerability assessments, we've been piloting, okay, what are the, what's the process to take this? And in our particular facilities, you know, planning processes, how do we identify um, different adaptation strategies? So that they did a workshop and have come up with a couple of, you know, planning efforts uh, that have identified, you know, where they can use this information. And then now we have with the Great America's Outdoors Act, we have some massive investments um, in uh, our infrastructure. And so taking some of that vulnerability information in uh, to, to those uh, designs as well. Thank you. So we have just about one minute left and we have a few questions. So 
um, Amanda and future speakers, if we don't have time to get to them all, please feel free to respond to them by typing in your answer. So our next question is from Stephen, and he, uh, he says, how do farms and farming systems and food security fit in with regional landscape level vulnerability assessments, or is all the work being discussed here focused within protected areas? Well, so in the park service, it's been interesting um, because we have a number of parks that within their, their historic telling their um, those stories that, that agriculture is part of the, how they, you know, this active agriculture is part of park management. Uh, and we haven't done a lot of those park specific, that, that might be a cluster or a, a resource that needs to be done in the future. But we, so far we've relied on where there have been regional efforts um, to pull that information that can, you know, inform some of the, so I think, um, um, uh, I, I'm thinking of right now we had a, a, a focus condition assessment for, for Martin Van Buren um, National Historical Park, and they have active agriculture there. And so thinking about how taking some of those available other flooding assessments um, to recognize how that's going to affect the timing of their, their agriculture and the partners who do the, the agriculture there about what they can plant and how they adapt um, where they still have that for us, they have the mission to try and um, uh, maintain both the, you know, some of the historical types of, of crops that are planted, but what might need to shift to still be uh, effective in the future. And um, also orchards are another, you know, example where we really are seeing that we're going to have to change some of the historical conditions have changed. Thanks. Thank you so much, Amanda. Um, and so, yes, there are a few questions left in the chat. If you wouldn't mind answering them via typing, that would be wonderful. Um, but we'll be moving on to our next talk. Uh, so our next talk is four speakers all together. Uh, we have Ashley Spivy and Lisa Bergstrom from Kenna Consulting and Kirk Havens and Molly Mitchell from Virginia Institute of Marine Sciences. And they will be collectively speaking on building capacity for Virginia Indian tribal climate resiliency and adaption programs. Thank you, Francis. Okay. All right, can everybody see that presentation? <laughs> okay, good. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Ashley Spivey. Um, I just wanna first thank Addie Rose for inviting us to be here today to share some of the challenges that the Virginia Indian tribal community is facing when it comes to climate change vulnerabilities, adaptation and resiliency efforts. Next slide, Lisa. So just to give you guys an introduction to the Virginia Indian community, um, they are there are seven federally recognized tribes in the state, and they include the Pamunkey, the Upper Mattapanai, the Rappahannock, Monacan, Chickahominy, Chickahominy Eastern Division, and the Nansamend. In addition to them, we also have four state recognized tribes that include the Nottoway, the Cherenhawk and Nottoway, the Patawomac and the Mattapanai. And you can see in the presentation here in this map that I've got, the majority of our tribal communities are located in the coastal tidewater region of Virginia. And historically and ancestrally, this is where our communities have been located. And so we have a very long relationship and infrastructure on Virginia's waterways and with Virginia's coastal resources. And that includes you know, everything from fisheries to oystering um, and you know, gartering medicine and foods from our wetlands. And so as you can imagine, these riverine and, and coastal resources are very integral to the communities, the cultures and the economies of the Virginia Indian communities. Um, currently, we have two reservation communities uh, that are still extant in Virginia. Um, that includes one of my communities, the Pamunkey Indian tribe. And both of those reservations are actually the uh, two of the oldest continually occupied reservations in the United States, established through treaties with England. And they are um, both located on two major river systems in the state of Virginia. The other tribes, while they are not centrally located on the water any longer, they still have lands that are tied um, to the waterways and they own those lands, their tribal lands, and they use those for economic purposes. 
Next slide, and I'll hand it over to Molly. So Virginia has a great deal of issue with sea level rise in particular. We have the highest rate of sea level rise along the Atlantic coast. And flooding in our low-lying areas has increased 577% since the 1970s. Why is that happening? Um, so part of it is that we have this kind of terraced landscape that you can see in this map here. And so we have these broad swaths of extensive flat lands um, that people live in. Um, so when water comes up just a little bit, it tends to flood a large proportion of land relative to the rise in sea level. Um, the other reason is that we have a really high rate of sea level rise. So there are a lot of different processes that are affecting it. Um, so there's both high rates of rise and there's also um, a high rate of subsidence or relatively high rate of subsidence. And then we have some ocean dynamics going on with the Gulf Stream that are all contributing to this rise of what's projected to be um, about a foot and a half to two feet of sea level rise by 2050. Next slide, please. So this is just an example of what that looks like. Um, this is where the Pamunkey and the Mattapanai rivers join at West Point. And in the 2020, you can see the areas that are light blue. These are um, marshes. So these are areas that are flooded twice daily. Um, and as we move through time to 2050 and 2100, we see the depth of the water increases greatly and that flooding starts to move on to the landscape. So now it's starting to not only do the marshes disappear, so all of the services they provide get lost, but we also see that roads and houses and farms start to become inundated too. Next slide, please. So your guy, you guys were getting just a snapshot of some of the climate change challenges and vulnerabilities that Virginia, especially coastal Virginia, is facing. Um, for the tribal communities, in addition to those, we have capacity challenges that really inhibit our abilities, multiple of our communities' abilities to be proactive about adaptation and resiliency efforts. So I wanna go over some of those challenges that we're facing today. One of those is a lack of institutional and state partnerships, partnerships with Virginia's tribal communities. Really, there's a lack of academic institutions that have built long sustainable partnerships or relationships with tribes in Virginia. Um, in addition to that, we don't have tribal colleges in this region. So we don't have institutions that are you know, dedicated to working for and with um, native communities in the state. We also have a lack in state agency and government support. Um, again, that has a lot to do with the fact that we have been only recognized by the Commonwealth uh, for much of you know, our government to government relationships. And as you can imagine, that brought very little su support. And with having newly federally recognized tribes, um, the state is also kind of you know, in a challenging capacity issue as well in trying to work more closely with the tribal communities. Now, these relationships are changing, partnerships are starting to form, but they really are in their infancy. And these institutions really, you know, are quite frankly at a loss in how to really start building those relationships at a, at a capacity that is going to support the tribal community and the issues that they need to address with climate change, adaptation and resiliency. Next slide. So as Ashley has explained, we have seven newly federally recognized tribes in Virginia, and I really can't emphasize the impact of that um, more, you know, uh, it, it is a great impact on the state. It's a great impact on the tribes. Um, the capacity issues that come along with that, the, the opportunity that comes with being federally recognized, the programs that are federally and state provided, the, the funding that is out there, all of that is coming at the rate of a fire hose for the tribes. And they really, um, as they try to build their administrative structures, they're having to prioritize what they do, of course. And so they're dealing with day-to-day um, -day living. They're dealing with health and wellness issues and housing and, and situations that are of immediate need to their communities. And what is falling aside are a lot of these um, preservation and conservation and 
um, and definitely resiliency topics. This isn't something, I mean, it is of great import to them, um, it, but they are having a hard time finding the capacity to address the issues and also in securing funding. When you don't have years and years of um, experience to show the federal government that you have, you know how to administer a large grant or how to um, even seek that sort of funding, it puts you at a disadvantage when you are trying to work in a um, competitive grant situation. So um, there are a lot of reasons why they don't have the ability right now to have dedicated people on the ground that are working on this. And um, it becomes an, an issue too of being um, fair and ethical. The people that are most, most need this help sometimes are the people that are least able to get the help. And so that's what we're trying to ad address here through our partnership with VIMS. And just to provide kind of a, I guess, a microscopic view of one community's challenges, um, I do want to very briefly talk about some of the Pamunkey Indian tribes efforts towards mitigating adaptation and resiliency for climate change challenges. And as I mentioned, this is my tribal community and I, I've worked actively in some of these initiatives that the tribe has undertaken um, to address the, you know, these issues that we're facing. So just a, a quick overview, um, as you can see in this, this map here, the, the reservation is a marshland peninsula. We only have about 1200 acres and we are almost completely surrounded by the Pamunkey River. And right now our community, and I, and I live in this community, so I, I see this on a, on a you know, daily basis myself, um, we're dealing with rapid, rapid shoreline erosion due to increased severe weather events, um, especially those north, nor'easters that we're about to get, uh, <laughs> that have had becoming you know, more frequent and are definitely having an impact on our shoreline. We're dealing with increased flooding and our land is sinking as well. And in addition to that, we are starting to see saltwater intrusion into our freshwater wetlands um, further downriver on the Pamunkey River. Now, with all of that happening, that clearly has you know, challenging and negative impacts on our cultural and natural resources. And quite frankly, we don't really differentiate between the two. Um, our natural resources are our cultural resources, and we are seeing the active uh, negative impact on those resources as we speak. So next slide, please. Now, my tribal community is, is one of the few um, that has really taken some strategic steps toward, towards addressing these challenges, but the way that we've been doing them has been intermittent. Um, and again, that's due to the lack of administrative and funding capacity that we have to implement the work that needs to be done. But we have done an, a shoreline archeological survey of the reservation to document the archeological sites along the shoreline before they disappear. And that assessment did um, reveal that we have lost several sites to shoreline erosion already. We've also partnered with VIMS uh, to develop a shoreline management plan for the reservation. And we have had the capacity to implement phase one of that plan for a sh living shoreline restoration of two particular vulnerable, vulnerable places on the shoreline. Um, that phase one was completed over two years ago, and we unfortunately, again, have not had the, the capacity, uh, particularly the funding capacity to take on implementing the rest of that management plan. And, you know, one of the conversations that we are having is, resi is resiliency even an option for our community on this piece of land anymore? Um, and as you can imagine, for a community who has been here for thousands of years, that's heartbreaking to even consider having to move your community. Um, but we might not have a choice. And so we are also seriously considering that op that as an option for the safety of our community. Next slide. Lisa, I think you're on mute. I am, every meeting. Um, so who's working to address these issues in Virginia? I I have to say there's a lot of people working on this and there's some really good projects happening in Virginia. Um, 
there are individuals within tribal communities, like Ashley said, you know, her tribe and, and a few others have been able to designate some time and get a little funding to start these processes and build these relationships. Um, that is the exception and not the rule. There are preservation and cultural heritage institutions that are working on um, the cultural natural resource protections that, and, and monitoring of climate change in Virginia. As Molly said, Virginia is highly vulnerable. It's happening quickly here. We are, um, we are seeing, I can't, I can't believe the amount of change and the, the, the flooding issues that we're seeing just due to our tidal um, movement and that have happened in the last five, 10 years. So what that means for the tribal communities though, is all of these preservation and cultural heritage institutions are working together on some things they haven't traditionally brought the tribes into these conversations. Um, so it, there is this social and environmental justice issue that's going on with underrepresented communities and who has a seat at the table and who, who has access to the climate, client, climate scientist, who has access to um, these networking opportunities and it, it's, it hasn't been the Virginia tribes. So what we are trying to foster with a model of working with them is to, to develop that trust building and that awareness and to, um, to do something as a, a collaborative effort that includes all voices and, all, and give everyone a seat at the table. One of the things that the Virginia Institute of Marine Science and, and helping with this fostering this relationship can bring to the table and is that the Virginia Institute of Marine Science and particularly the Center for Coastal Resources Management has decades of experience in translating science into action. And so we work directly with local governments and local communities to disseminate information that those particular communities have identified as useful in their planning and, and management of resources. So we generally do this through a uh, uh, interactive web portal that's designed and tailored specifically for the community needs. And so that's uh, one, of the, one of the aspects we'll help to, to foster this type of inter interaction with the tribes. <clears throat> So when we're talking about tribal capacity and, and building this with, um, with VENS, with the Marissa project that we're going to work on, um, one of the, the things that we keep foremost in mind is tribal sovereignty. Um, we want, these are sovereign nations and they, they, have a lot of, they have a lot to share, but they also have a lot of, a lot of reason not to trust um, the institutions that are approaching them right now. Um, historically, they have not been um, uh, welcoming to them or they have been an afterthought, a, a check a box. And that is absolutely what we want to try to eliminate in our, in our work moving forward. So what we will be doing in this project is we will be inviting the tribes, first of all, do you telling them about the project and do you want to participate with us? And if they, if they would like to come and hear more about it, we're gonna do um, a series of round table discussions, uh, listening sessions to hear about what are, their, what are their concerns? What are they seeing? What are, we are not there to tell them what they need to be doing or how to do it at this point. We, we want to listen to them about what their concerns are, what are their capacity issues? What, what, can they, what do they need? And then from that, we're hoping to develop a series of strategic plans. First strategic plan we're gonna be doing, uh, honestly working with them is so that they can um, make this a tribal engagement process that is durable and sustainable for them for um, all kinds of things that move forward into the future. We will also be developing tribal strategic plans for climate resiliency with each individual tribe. Um, that's a very collaborative process. Kina has done that sort of work with the tribes and with cultural resources. And um, we find it's a really good model and it, it, leaves a, it leaves them with a plan. It also develops resources and networking opportunities for the tribes um, in a way that they don't have right now. I also wanna say a really important part of this project is that the tribal partners that do participate are paid for their time. Um, that is part of the capacity building efforts. There's also going to be training involved with how do you, you know, what does all this mean? What does the climate science mean? What, um, 
how can you approach networking with these different organizations? What is going to work for you? Um, making those connections that they don't currently have and also helping those institutions that really do want to work with the tribes. But as I think someone had mentioned earlier that that pathway has not been open and a lot of times they don't know how to get that started. So that's part of the model we're developing. And we hope that this will be a model for um, tribes across the entire Chesapeake Bay watershed. So for this particular project, we do have some funding from NOAA. It is not um, enough to complete the multi-year project that this is going to be. So we are going to be looking for more funding support and resources and for those networking opportunities with other organizations. Thank you so much. We are over time. Um, so maybe if you wanna give your closing thoughts while yep. people can put some questions into the chat, that would be perfect. So closing thoughts. <laughs> um, just again, a thank you to, to NECASC for inviting us um, to be here today to have these conversations, providing the platform. Um, you know, I just, the main closing thought that I want to lead with is that I think that, you know, I didn't even know about you guys until um, the summer, right? And, and the networking and opportunities and the resources that you guys could provide to the Virginia Indian tribal community, which is in the southern most portion of, of the Northeast, right, um, region that we're talking about here. So I just want to, you know, bring home that I hope that we can, can continue to network, work together, because I really feel like you guys can help take the lead and set the foundation for addressing a lot of these issues that we've addressed here in our in our presentation um, moving forward. So again, thank you. Um, and we look forward to any questions and to future conversations. And I'll just add, if I can, while you're people are putting in questions that, you know, there is no real conduit for establishing, uh, you know, provide capacity building funds for the for the tribes in Virginia. And, and there is a real need and also an exciting opportunity uh, to establish a long-term mechanism to help the Virginia tribes build this capacity that they're gonna need uh, if they're gonna address resiliency in their communities. So it's a real opportunity. <clears throat> Challenge, but an opportunity. Thank you all so much. This was really inspiring to hear um, all this work that's been going on and all the collaboration that's involved with it. Um, it's definitely given me a lot to think about as I'm looking to go forward in my career and how to, how to collaborate in a helpful way that really benefits local communities. So thank you. Um, we are a little crunched on time. Um, and so feel free to everyone on the call to put your questions into the Q&A. And if you all wouldn't mind answering via uh, the chat or typing, um, that would be wonderful. Um, but to keep us on schedule, we will be moving on to our next talk. Our next talk is by Karen Terwilliger um, from Terwilliger Consulting, and they will be discussing vulnerability of regional species of greatest conservation need from state wildlife action plans. So, thank you. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay and see the slide? Okay, great. <clears throat> Um, thank you for the opportunity to share with you our work with Northeast Regional Species of Greatest Conservation Need and State Wildlife Action Plans. Um, we've been so fortunate over the years to work with some incredible biologists and managers in the 14 Northeast states. So this project has been in collaboration with the Northeast Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, Northeast Fish and Wildlife Diversity Technical Committee and their swap coordinators. Uh, Tracy and I have also recently been really fortunate to work with Michelle Stottinger and her colleagues at NECAS uh, on this project that allows us to take a deeper dive and a closer look at assessing climate change threats and actions to these uh, regional species of greatest conservation needs. Uh, and a lot of our data comes from the Northeast State Wildlife Action Plans. So we have been assisting NECAS in identifying the climate change science needs of the 14 state fish and wildlife agencies in the Northeast. Specifically, we've been trying to help provide climate change information to inform the state wildlife action plans that you've heard a little bit about that are gigantic comprehensive that plans that include thousands of species and their habitats. So really important plans to get involved with. 
Um, but we have been able, since this incredible document was produced in 2015 by NECAS, um, which helped and provided incredible data and tools for all 14 Northeast State Wildlife Action Plans. First of all, it helped them meet their regional needs, not just their state needs, but their regional Northeast needs and climate change requirements. So NECAS gave us the tools and the data to plug right into these state wildlife action plans. So that was so successful and so helpful to the 14 state fish and wildlife agencies that we are trying now to provide additional information for the next round of swaps, which will be due in 2025. And specifically, we're gonna to try to focus and refine priority species, habitats, climate change threats and actions. So what are these regional species of greatest conservation need? Well, just as state fish and wildlife agencies identify species of greatest conservation need for their state, uh, since 2005, the 14 Northeast state fish and wildlife agencies have worked together to prioritize this at the regional scale, actually since 1999. And the good thing is there's incentive because there's funding for it as well through a very special uh, re regional conservation needs program grant, which is incredible. So, Regional species of greatest conservation need are those species of high conservation concern that primarily occur in the Northeast region. In other words, these all the 14 Northeast states share stewardship responsibility for them. And uh, a very wonderful goal uh, is to use this non-regulatory list to provide focus, resources, and collaboration to conserve these species of mutual conservation concern and their habitats for current and future generations in the Northeast. Well, you'll see why we wanted to do regional species of greatest conservation need, because the 14 Northeast state wildlife action plans listed almost 3 thousand species of greatest conservation need. That's a lot to focus on. So the 14 states work together to prioritize down to or identify 358 regional species of greatest conservation need, a much more realistic focus. So we, uh, our consulting team, compiled and coordinated, developed the method, and worked with over 100 taxa experts across the region and this list will be updated again in 2022 so that it will be ready for all states to use in their 2025 action plans. So this is the current list. Kathy mentioned earlier that there's 358 species. Uh, most of them are indeed invertebrates, but these are the taxa that are presently contained um, in the RSGCN list. Each five years, we hope we can find more species uh, expertise and more data so we can include more. And this is how they're distributed uh, in the Northeast with Virginia having, I'll say, the lion's share of the species of regional conservation concern. Well, we have a, a great method. It looks complicated, but it's very practical. It uses state, regional, national uh, priority conservation status. And we update this list every five years. And basically there's two real big criteria, regional stewardship responsibility, which means the proportion of the species range that occurs in the Northeast compared to its entire range and conservation concern status. In other words, how imperiled is this species? So we've been working really closely with NECAS now to add more species for regional species of greatest conservation need. And we compile it all into this monstrous database that is fully accessible to all of you, to everyone, at these two websites. Right now, we have concern and occurrence data at all scales. We have gotten habitat association information. We've now identified limiting factors with all of these experts and our work now moving forward is going to identify the threats and actions from the state wildlife action plans as confirmed by these hundreds of taxa experts across the region. 
Um, so at this point, we are happy to share our preliminary results. We've only gotten through half of them because there's so much data, but we're really excited about it. Um, so basically the process is, we have identified limiting factors from literature searches, from the SWAP database, and then we get the, all these experts across the region to confirm them. Then the same thing with the SWAP threats. We identify them from the state wildlife action plans that have gone into the, the regional SWAP database. Then just as a matter of business to be so we can talk apples to apples, we use a common language, and we convert these to standardized format for our Northeast lexicon um, into direct threat categories. And then for each of those threats, we can identify um, the most uh, recurring threats that we then uh, work with the, the regional taxa teams to identify as the ultimate regional threats. So we're taking it to the regional level. These are the taxa teams that we've been working with. Again, uh, well over 100 experts. And each team reviews and then confirms what they believe to be the draft regional threats. And we're going to get to actions. Uh, we did this through a survey mon monkey. Um, and what we asked them to do was not just identify the threats, but we also asked them to identify these characteristics of each threat. What's the severity? What's the immediacy? Whoops. What's the reversibility? What's the spatial extent? And then um, we used, again, common standard language to match our lexicon and synthesis in the Northeast. But we also, working with NECAFs, asked them to identify any climate change amplifiers to any other threat. So this was a really important question to ask. Again, they confirmed them and we are continuing to fill in all the data gaps and try to analyze all this information. But here we have some preliminary results. And first I wanna compare this to the work we did in 2016, where we had thousands of threats for the almost 3,000 species of greatest conservation need. At that point, we hadn't identified them for the regional species of greatest conservation need. Let's look where climate change fell out. The, the biggest threat in the region was pollution, followed by development, followed by natural systems modifications, followed by invasive species. And then the fifth largest threat was climate change. That was back in 2016 for all 3,000 species of greatest conservation need. Well, look at what our preliminary results are showing now. As we focus down to 126 regional species of greatest conservation need, now these are mostly invertebrate species for which the data are available. Um, look at where climate change is now. It is the, mo the highest recurring threat cited in the region, uh, followed by biological resource use, in other words, collecting, harvesting, bycatch, uh, pollution again, um, invasive species again, and development. So really, we still kind of have our top five. So let's look a little closer here at these climate change threats. Again, we're using standard classifications, so we're all speaking the same language, and it can be used and adapted to any plan at any level, as long as we use these terms. Um, so we had almost 20% of all of the biggest, most highest priority threats uh, were assigned to climate change. Let's look specifically, multiple taxa uh, experts assigned them to multiple uh, climate stressors, but one of the biggest one, most recurring one, was habitat loss and shifting, followed by altered precipitation and hydrology. So uh, those are the biggies in the Northeast, then of course followed by temperature. So those are what the experts say are the most important climate change threats that are impacting regional species of greatest conservation need in the Northeast. So let's look even further at this. What did the experts tell us and the state wildlife action plans tell us about how climate change is affecting all the other threats that these species are subjected to? How are they amplifying these other existing threats? Well, 
66% of all the threats are amplified by these climate change stressors. So it's overwhelming two thirds of all the stresses. If it's not climate change, which was 20%, then the other two thirds are being impacted by uh, and amplified by climate change, which is huge. Um, so climate change stressors are pretty big in the Northeast to say the least for regional species of greatest conservation need. So we can look at the data in a lot of different ways. These are just some preliminary ways we're looking at it, but we can sort by the number of threats for this, the greatest number of species. So the species that have the highest level of regional threats by uh, climate change. Well, we, let's just look at the charismatic megavertebrates. Um, and right on top, we have two uh, high elevation mammals, but let's focus because the talk before us was talking about coastal uh, resiliency. Let's look at the birds. All but one are, are coastal bird species. Uh, then of course, we have a lot of marine fish that are really impacted by bycatch and take. Uh, there's another way we can sort the data. Um, so we can sort it by the type of threat, the degree of threat. Let's look at just the most severe threats, the most immediate or the most spatially large regional threats. And this gives us a different list of species. Uh, the bats, of course, are really high on this list um, for many reasons, temperature change in their hibernaculums, um, in their maternity colonies, uh, wind energy, development, um, the right whale, uh, certainly coastal impacts. And um, again, let's look at the birds. Here we are with all the coastal bird impacts. So we know we have a lot of work to do there. So let's kind of try to bring this full circle. We've looked at the vulnerability, the, the limiting factors that then uh, make them vulnerable to the exposure or all of these regional threats. But then how do we link that to actions? Well, we're fortunate that state wildlife action plans link all of these variables, species to habitats, to threats, to actions. So it comes back around in this beautiful cycle of this is how we can get to actions. So let's just use real quick the example of coastal birds uh, because we've talked a lot about sea level rise here. Um, these are some of the just the top actions that have been pulled out of state wildlife action plans that address the sea level rise, the coastal resiliency. What we want to do now, what we will be doing um, over the next year or two to get ready for state wildlife action plans is to work with the Northeast SWAP coordinators, the technical committee and NECAS to make these climate smart. Um, not only can we identify priority actions, but we can help them be climate smart. So these are the next steps we're gonna do is we got a lot more work to fill in a lot of the data gaps, get more invertebrates uh, in the data set. And then we are gonna be working with all of the partners to make these actions, refine them, prioritize them and make them climate smart. Not just for swaps, but they can be used for any plan. So I've gotten the thumbs up, time up. So I'm gonna stop <laughs> um, and just remind you, please, please, please. Uh, we have a workshop tomorrow that talks a little bit more about how to use this data and how NECAS and we are all working hard to get science in science information and tools in the hands of managers. So please join us for the workshop tomorrow. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, so yes, reminder, please put your questions in the chat. Um, I had a question actually about if, if you take into account, uh, I guess I call it a domino effect maybe, of some of like those coastal fish that maybe are food sources for some of the birds, if there's a larger depletion in the fish, do you see an exponential then decrease in bird populations or threat to bird populations, et cetera? That's a great question. And uh, NECAS has already identified that as a priority and they're act they actually have several new um, proposals and ongoing projects to look exactly at that. And I think that's where we really need to focus um, is it's great to be able to pull out these species and have a focus, 
But what we all have to remember is that these species are all linked to habitats and they have common habitats or ecosystems. So we can group all of the different taxa and even the cultural socioeconomic impacts as well um, to these ecosystems. And we already have seen a lot on coastal, we know high elevations. So um, I think just recognizing that connectivity and making sure that we account for all of those species and their relationships in that, those ecosystems is really important. So that's a great question. Thank you so much. Kirk, do you have a question? Yeah, Karen, great talk. Uh, uh, and one of the things that we're doing in Virginia, I don't know whether you have uh, addressed this, is this issue of the great squeeze between migrating coastal habitats and highway infrastructure and road infrastructure and critical infrastructure. Uh, so um, I'm assuming that's going to be more and more of an issue as you move forward, as things would like to be able to migrate their habitat as sea level rises uh, uh, into the upland or riparian upland, but run against hard infrastructure, particular, particularly transportation infrastructure. Yes, Kirk, thank you. Um, you know, even though transportation didn't show up there as like the top five, I think it was six or seven. Um, and the Northeast states and most of their swaps have identified these as real problems. So the cool thing about working with these priority species, um, there's a specific project that works with say rare wetland turtles. Well, we all know the issues of roadkill <laughs> and turtles and reptiles in general. So this project, they're working with experts across the region, across the state boundaries, all the turtle and snake experts to identify specific areas for the road infrastructure. And they're identifying best management practices um, through this project and working with the local VDOTs. And I know um, Department of, of, of Vermont has been working a lot with that as well. So there's some great, that's a great question. And yes, talk about a pinch. <laughs> Thank you. And if there's any other questions, oh, looks like John has one. Yes, thanks, Karen. That was a great talk. So uh, one one of the things you showed is is Virginia has the largest abundance of those species. And so, of course, the natural next question is, is that because of the climate there? And can you speak to the ch shifts in climate and how that's associated with projections moving forward? That's a great question. Um, Honestly, Virginia is very large with um, diverse ecosystems. So it has many, it has, I won't, don't say the best of both worlds, but the high elevation issues um, for many species up and down the Appalachians, all the way then to the coast. So uh, it's also um, a reflection of the sheer number of uh, biodiversity there, uh, of course, as you move south. And that's especially true with aquatics. Um, Virginia has huge freshwater diversity, mussels, crayfish, um, uh, stoneflies, mayflies. So that's probably one of the big reflections of the numbers. I'll just, if you don't mind, I'll just add yeah. too that it's yeah. probably an also another issue of the fact that a lot of these it's the, it seems to be the northern limit of some species and the southern limit of others, you know, kind of comes right at Virginia in the Virginia area. Thank you. Um, so I think we have one more question from the chat from Eric Salas. Is dispersal behavior of the species incorporated in climate models? Hmm. Um, well, this project doesn't do any modeling per se. But um, I know that if you attend our workshop tomorrow, that is one of the most important things that we're trying to get is what do we need? What are those factors that we need to incorporate? So um, Eric, please come to our workshop and make that need known. Um, I'm quite sure that um, I know Amberish has got a number of variables that he plans to model. Uh, but I'm not sure if this is on the list, so it'd be a great, great one for you to add. Well, thank you so much to all of our speakers. We are at our time limit. Um, so I will pass this on to John for our closing remarks. Yep, so we'll keep it short and sweet because I know people want to get to lunch. But yes, and a, a, a huge thank, thank you to all the speakers here for taking the time to give these sort of informative and really sort of a diverse set of talks, which was really fantastic. 
Um, just want to make a, sure, make a shout out that this afternoon's sessions on building adaptive capacity and landscape level conservation are going to start at two o'clock. Um, so we have an extended break, but I hope to see a lot of you back at two o'clock. There's also sort of the survey during the lunchtime. Addie Rose in the chat mentioned a survey on talking about input for themes um, and action that we'd love to get your sort of um, your responses on. So if you have some time, please. Uh, fill out that quick survey um, and hope to see everyone back at two. And just a final thanks to everyone in the session. We really appreciate you taking the time to give these talks and to provide sort of uh, the, yeah, these, the information that you did. <laughs> so hope to see everybody back at two.